Welcome to the, the, uh, the last and final session of the um, New York BHA Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Learn to Hunt session. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, getting your game home safely. And um, we got um, four of us that are going to be talking to you today. Um, my name is Ken Berg and um, I am um, out of Western New York, but originally I come from Norway. I've uh, been 15 years in the U.S. I've been an outdoorsman for pretty much my entire life, but I had a, a gap of about 15, 20 years while um, I um, was focused on, on uh, work and career and family. Um, but about five years ago, I decided um, that um, I needed to do something else. I needed to get back to nature because I was missing it. So I um, started doing trail running and outdoors activities in in the uh, public lands we have available um, around New York State. And, uh, and then a few years ago, decided to get back into hunting. And, um, and it's been uh, really great for me. Um, and uh, I'm here as a, as a lot of my friends and peers call, fashionably late hunter, um, providing some perspective on how it is to get into hunting when you don't have a huge network and a family uh, around you that, that can help you with that, but um, you, you find your way by yourself. Um, so I'm very happy to be here, to be part of this, this session here, and um, I'm going to hand it over to Brian. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Brian Bird. Uh, I've been hunting my entire life. Uh, started, you know, seven, eight years old. Uh, my dad was pretty much a genius and figured out it was easier to train two sons rather than two dogs. So I was basically, my brother and I were his flushing dog for many years. I um, uh, started with archery. Archery was the, at the time, you could hunt deer at 14. So I started, I got my first deer with a bow at 16. Uh, my first buck at uh, 19 uh, with a gun. Uh, in the southern tier of New York, right on the Pennsylvania border, but I'm currently right at the southern edge of the Adirondacks, uh, right all of New York, which is near Lake George. And uh, I'm going to pass it over to Nate now. Hello, I'm Nate Kennedy. Um, I'm also a lifelong hunter. I'm, um, I'm on the communications team for the New York chapter. I'm also a, a Region 8 volunteer coordinator. So if any of you are from the Finger Lakes area, that's where I'm at. Um, I'm a 4-H educator with Cornell Cooperative Extension. I'm relatively active in um, a handful of other uh, conservation organizations. I do some work with the local Ducks Unlimited chapter and the New York State Conservation Council. Um, looking forward to hanging out with everybody. My hunting season, at least my deer season, kicks off on on Sunday in the northern zone. Um, we're in on time here for getting all that underway. Um, been doing a little bit of goose hunting in the meantime, but um, yeah, having fun and looking forward to another season and um, look forward to hanging out with everybody. Matt? Matt is just joining back in, and there he is, and he's got to unmute, you, unmute himself, and then he should be good to roll. I'm good to roll. <laughs> is everybody done? All right. Um, I'm, Matt, I'm Matt Corcoran. Um, you, you're going to hear my, my two-year-old in the background. I'm sorry. I tried to do it in the car. It just didn't work out. Uh, I'm Matt Corcoran. I'm a volunteer with BHA. Um, I am uh, out of Region 1, which is Long Island. Um, I've been hunting probably since I'm 19. I've done a lot of trapping. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of that stuff. Um, what I want to talk to you guys about tonight is um, tagging, dragging, packing out, and uh, getting to the point where, you know, you don't need a pickup truck to, uh, to hunt. Um, so first things is, uh, is tagging. Um, you need to tag your game as soon as uh, as soon as you uh, you come up on it. At least at least notch your tag and start to fill it out. Um, you don't want to get jammed up having um, having any issues. I, I can tell you guys a quick story. We were hunting um, the the January shotgun season here on Long Island. That's the only time we can hunt with firearms. And uh, a buddy of mine, he put a deer down and. Um, Got uh, got real excited, got caught up in the moment, started gutting a deer, didn't even think about his license, 
gutted the deer, started dragging it out. When once he got out of the woods, um, there was a conservation officer standing right there. We were on we were on private property, but you know, conservation officer can come on man. No, no problem. And uh, so he hadn't tagged the deer and it was gutted and you know. He was an older gentleman and uh, the uh, conservation officer read him the riot act and didn't, didn't wind up writing him for anything, but um, you know, just, just make sure that you tag your deer, at least notch the tag before you really get started and dig it into anything. Um, with that being said, talking about dragging, um, I, I don't have any, I write everything on paper. I, I don't have any fancy slides for you. No pictures of deer are getting dragged out. Uh, but, um, mostly dragging, you know, dragging a deer is labor. It's, you know, you're, you're going to drag a, a dead body out of the woods, you know? Um, so what I really like to talk to you about with, with, with dragging deer out, um, is more physical fitness, um, and, and knowing what your abilities are, you know, if, if, you know, if you're not working, every day or if, you're, or if you're sitting at a desk every day and your physical activity is walking to your car, you know, you probably shouldn't be running into the woods a couple of miles back. You know what I mean? And then expecting that you're going to be able to drag a deer out. Um, know your abilities and, and hunt to those, you know, abilities. You know, if you want to put more into it, I, I mean, you know, me, I, I think about deer season all year long. It's, it's all that's on my brain. You can ask my wife, it drives her nuts. Um, but that's all I think about. So I, you know, I work out, I, I, you know, I physically prepare myself for deer season. Um, you hear stories every year of, of guys, uh, you know, going in the woods, hunting, they, they shoot something and they have a heart attack once they start to drag it out. You know, you got to think your, your heart, you get super excited when a deer comes in, your heart goes up. Next thing you know, you're gutting it, you're excited, you can't wait to show everybody, especially if you're hunting where there's no cell phone service. You start dragging that deer out, your heart rate goes through the roof. And if that's the first time that year that, that you've gotten your heart rate up, you know, you're asking for problems. So I think that... Um, being physically fit, you know, and in sound sound shape um, is a very important thing here in deer season, or at least just knowing that, you know, it's going to be a daunting task uh, dragging out of the woods. Uh, with that being said, you know, you got a couple of, um, you got a couple of, um, a couple of ways you can drag out of the woods. I mean, you can um, take a, you know, drag it, just grab by the antlers or the ear or a leg. You can drag it forward. You can drag it backwards. Just get it out of the woods is the, the main option. Um, you can get into quartering it right there in the woods. Um, I, I do that sometimes. I know uh, Brian's going to get into that um, real in depth. Um, but you can you can quarter it out, and you don't need anything special. I mean, you could take an old Jansport backpack, and you can fit a quarter in there. You might have to make two trips, three, whatever it is, but any backpack will do. You throw it in your backpack, you get it out of the woods. You're not dragging it. At least you're carrying it on your back at that point. Um, you know, as long as you're out in some place where there's cell phone activity, you can always phone a friend, you know, call in a lifeline get somebody there to, to, to help you out, you know? Um, there's, uh, there's jet sleds out there. I've utilized that a lot. Um, that's going to kind of work in with, I, I, along with Brian, uh, for the last two years have hunted out of a Prius. So, you know, you do not need a pickup truck to, to, to hunt. Um, I've trapped out of a Prius. I've, hunted out of a Prius. There's been multiple animals in my Prius. Um, so um, I've utilized my, my jet sled um, a few times now. I didn't, I didn't actually figure it out until last year, but um, with a jet sled and a set of two by fours, you could put a whole deer in the back of that truck, uh, back of that Prius. And, you know, there's no blood, there's no anything. 
Um, you can look them up. They're on Amazon. They're like 50 bucks. You don't need the giant one. You can get the junior. Um, you can outfit them. You can drill holes in them and put extra ropes. You can, you can go nuts. Um, if you don't want to go that route, uh, dragon, you could just simply take a rope, tie it around the neck, take that rope. It's going to hurt your hands after a little while. You take the rope and you tie it around a good stick. You grab it, put it behind your back and just keep going. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of options, um, there. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. Plastic sheeting, you know, um, you can line your car with plastic sheeting, um, you know, get the odor things because I've, I have gotten a lot of blood all over the car and, uh, you know, that's not good for the, for the kids or, or the, the flies coming in and out and not pretty. Um, so, you know, with all that, um, make sure you tag, you know, um, make sure you tag your animal, make sure you're physically fit to get, um, to get that animal out of the woods. And, um, you know, you don't need a pickup truck. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off. So Brian, do you want to go? Okay. Yeah, I'm next. And yeah, I agree. I, I do have a picture of a deer in the back of my Prius. Um, but at the jet sled is a great idea because I ice fish also and the jet sled I have fits perfectly back there. So uh, it's, and it's easy to load. It's perfect. Great idea. But um, yeah, so I, um, my part of this aspect is to uh, talk about uh, processing, deer processing. Once you get it to your house or get it in the car, what do you do with it next? Um, a little bit of background on that. You know, growing up, my family always we, uh, we raised and slaughtered everything, uh, beef, pork, chickens, turkeys, deer. Uh, we raised it on the farm. We killed it right there. Um, while I was in grad school in Michigan, I worked for a, a processor, um, and he would do between 800 and 1,000 deer per year. I worked with him a bunch of years, so I've uh, seen a lot of deer. So I'm coming at this from the from the uh, point of view of somebody who's been in a processor and have seen mistakes people have made and ideas to try to get you to prevent from making those mistakes. Um, as I tell other people too, you ask four hunters their opinion on one subject, you're going to get six answers. So this is this is where I'm coming from based on the deer I've processed and what I've seen uh, go from there. Um, we do have some slides uh, to pop up here. Um, First thing about processing is do you do it yourself or do you take it in? Um, or, well, actually, processing starts in the field. Starts with field dressing. Um, the end product of your on your plate is a direct result of the second you pull that trigger. The better the shot, the cleaner the kill, the quicker the kill, the better you do getting removing the entrails out of the deer, the better that end product is going to be. Uh, tools I take in the field, um, I take Simply, I've got a little folding knife. It's got about a three inch blade. You don't need anything large. You don't need a fixed blade. Um, we'll get to that in a second why you don't need that. But um, the key for me is a narrow blade. You want about an inch wide. You want about three, four inches long. Uh, if you watched all these presentations, Tony had a picture of a knife in the beginning. That was a perfect knife. It's kind of narrow because that narrow, thin blade, Long blade really comes in to remove when you're at you know at the anus end of the deer. That's that's where that thin blade comes in. A lot of knives I see marketed as field knives for whitetails are way too wide. You can't get in there and 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 clean things out efficiently with a wide knife. Um, I'm going to step back a little bit to the tips. First, remove the entrails as soon as possible. Many reasons for that, but uh, I I believe this is my opinion. There's probably people who are going to disagree with that, but if you open that cavity, the first thing you notice is the smell. That smell is, it is analogous to an aromatic if you're cooking. You use uh, oregano or um, rosemary, especially. Those are aromatics. That smell from the guts is going to start to permeate through the meat. And especially if you open that up. If you have a bad shot and have a, a gut shot, and that's, it's not necessarily the bacteria permeating through the meat, it's that odor. That odor is, it sticks to you, it's 
sticks to everything. It'll permeate that beer. So get those guts out as soon as possible. Um, I'm on that same subject. I, I'm coming at this from white-tailed deer for the most part. I'm going to say from the Northeast where we're not necessarily owning everything out, quartering everything out. Quartering is it. Yeah, I've, I've never quartered a deer to bring it out, but I have cut a deer in half to bring it out. Uh, I can cover that real quick here shortly, but you've got to get, in my opinion, you got to get those guts out as soon as possible. That, that odor, what's in those guts, is permeating through that cavity. Um, so the quicker, the better. Um, the, uh, the way I've cut a deer in half, Matt talked about quartering it when, and you can, you know, quartering a deer is just as it sounds. There's the front half, the front leg is the front quarter. There's two of those back and a half, you know, you'll, also, you'll see a picture of a hind quarter here in a minute. Um, I, I have taken a deer and keeping the last rib with the rear end of the deer, you cut it in half that way half the deer you can throw it over your shoulder much quicker um i leave the skin on it's a, so and it's i've only done it a, few, a couple times usually I'm, I'm close enough that you just drag it as, as man was talking about uh along with that talking about dragging um i've seen numerous places i've seen them coming into the shop i've seen videos of very popular hunting uh shows that when they deer's down they're showing you how to gut it they split the pelvis, which is the, between the rear legs. They split right down the pelvis. Sometimes they'll actually saw through that pelvis. And then they'll split the ribs. Um, in the field, wire gutting to do that is really unnecessary. What happens is you open that up to contamination. Um, I've seen so many deer where they, they bring it in. There's a, there's a giant knife gash into the hindquarters, which is a great chunk of meat. You don't really want to ruin um, and I've seen it full of dirt, full of leaves, just everything that's, as you're dragging along, it's in there. So I recommend don't split that chest cavity or pelvis until you get it to where you're going, because it's not going to cool. It's not cooling while you're dragging it. So all you're doing is messing up that, that, that you know, good chunk of meat, especially in the hind quarter. So don't split that until you're going to hang it or get it where you got to go. Um, so then uh, another thing to help with the final product is uh, kidney fat. Now, as you're gutting the deer, um, it, it's going to be up against basically the, the tenderloin. It's up against the, it's, the deer is upright it's on the upper part of the cavity when you're, um, and it's on the ground and the, chest cavity, or the, the cavity is towards you. It's on the bottom. Leave that in. It, it's kind of, it looks kind of bubbly, white. What that's going to do, that's going to protect the tenderloins from drying out. Leave that fat on there, and that fat's going to be a barrier between the outside air or coldness and the uh, tenderloins, so it'll protect them from drying out, and you're going to have a much better product by doing that. Um, not only that, when you save that kidney fat, I'll talk about it towards the end, is um, that stuff makes awesome soap. So uh, to leave the kidney fat in, and then la lastly, starts with you know, processing starts with the field dressing because you're going to eat some of those parts, um, liver and heart. I grew up, uh, we never ate any of that. My dad is a product of his parents who were depression era and would never eat liver if you made him because he ate it as a kid. So we grew up, we never had it. And then in, I was in college, had some couple friends that were into it. And now it's like, that's the first meal. First meal is liver, heart is awesome. And there's, um, now some people, I, you know, you see around all fat, that's the membrane around the stomach and intestine. It, it almost looks like a spider web. Uh, people will save that for various recipes and then some do the kidneys. I generally don't do the call fat or kidneys. Um, kidneys are usually stay in with that kidney fat uh, to protect the tenderloins. But, um, you know, as far as eating parts from inside, it's liver and heart for me. Uh, removing that liver, just be careful. There's a gallbladder and bile. You don't want to get that all over everything. You especially don't want to get it in the cavity. So when you remove that whole mass out, you've got the liver. Make sure to cut around you know, be a little generous and cut around that gallbladder and, and pile. So you see when you get that paint on there and it's not, that's not very good to get that there. So it starts with field dressing. So that's, um, I'll go back to tools real quick. I use the zip ties, the zip ties I use to seal off. So when I start gutting that beer, I start at the anus. That's where that long skinny knife comes in because there's nothing to ruin except for what's called the oyster steak, which most people probably don't even pull out of that. 
there's nothing to ruin back there. You go in and make sure you're on the inside. You run that thin bladed knife in a circle all around that pelvis and everything frees up. You can pull it out and you zip tie it. And there's no feces. There's nothing going to leak out of that onto your cavity. You pull it back through into the cavity. Um, so, and then the, the Ziploc, if you use one gallon, I use some freezer bags, one gallon freezer Ziploc bags, that'll hold a kidney and a liver, no problem. So I think that's it. Gloves, if you want them. Um, I really like using gloves, especially when it's super cold because your hands are going to get, I mean, obviously you're in a warm cavity, but once you're done, your hands are going to freeze. So I like to use the gloves to keep the hands a little bit drier. But I think that's about it for field dressing. Um, again, any questions, make sure to throw them up there. Uh, next, taking it to a processor. Uh, there's no shame in sending your deer to a processor. So many people, you know, want to push you about, you've got to cut your own deer up. Great to try. We'll talk a little bit at the, at the end, but there's no, there's no shame in it. Take it to a processor. You do a good job. Uh, if you want to, if you go to the New York State uh, DEC webpage, they have a list. Follow that link. They have a list and just do a search. New York DEC uh, Deer Venison Processors. They will, um, uh, there's a whole list. There's a whole list of processors. And some other resources, if you're unfamiliar with the area, uh, check butcher shops. Most of them probably won't do it. Uh, the shop I work for was USDA inspected, so we couldn't even like look at a deer. Um, but they're going to know somebody. Somebody in that shop is going to know somebody that knows somebody that's going to cut deer up. Uh, same with a meat cutter, local grocery store. You go in a grocery store, meat cutter, look for the person that looks like they've been there the longest. Say, hey, I need a deer cut up. They can't even help. They're going to know somebody. So the butchering community is a very small community. It, they all kind of know where to go. And lastly, the DC and con officers. They, I mean, NCON uh, you know, monitors medicine processing plants. So they're, they're going to know if that list, I give it the link above, above is not current, they're going to know where to go. So give them a call. Their numbers are all in the back of every one of the uh, uh, hunting guides. So the next up is um, uh, if you are going to have a process, do the, do the homework right now, September. Do the homework now, figure out where they are, call them. Because they, everyone has their own little procedure. Um, the, the shop I work for, for in Michigan, we had a couple things. It had to have the skin on. And that was mostly because at the time, their hides were worth a lot of money. So the, he didn't want anything to do with a deer that didn't have a hide on it. We, we wouldn't accept it. If it didn't have a hide, we wouldn't accept it. Also, if we cut the, uh, the hamstrings, the, the, the Achilles tendon in the back, if those were cut, we wouldn't accept it. Because everything we had was on a rail, on a hook. We had to hook the deer. So, um, and I know one... Uh, person, I don't know if he's still doing it, but he's down near the Troy area, Troy, New York. He only accepts boneless meat. So you got to have it all skinned out, all boneless, and then he'll make it in the sausages and stuff. But, um, but call them now because if you have a deer on the ground in the back of your car and you're trying to call around for a processor, it's too late. You're, you're not going to be able to get in. Call them now, figure out what to do. It'll be miles ahead. The last part of this for the processor is uh, what to expect back. It's going to be a lot less than you think. Um, one thing we always heard is like, oh, I brought a deer in. This is all I get back. This what's wrong with this. A lot of things to consider. First of all, the place I worked at was all boneless. So we, we, there was no bones. So right there, you're going to lose a, a large percentage of that, that carcass. The other uh, thing is uh, loss from a uh, shot wound. Uh, if you destroy the front shoulders, you know, you're not going to get that meat back. You don't want that meat back. If it's full of shot, uh, you know, uh, lead or blood, you don't want that stuff back. So you're not, you're generally not going to get it back. Um, I would say for an average New York deer, uh, I'm going to say, a, you know, a year and a half, two year and a half year old deer, 100, 120 pounds, you're looking at 40, 50 pounds of boneless meat when you get back. You know, if you have to get 40% of your deer back, that's, that's doing pretty good. Um, now on the processor end, we don't want your deer meat. We aren't stealing your deer meat. No one's stealing deer meat. It's just, it's not, you, you have to realize just how much meat is really there. It's, uh, we would hear all the time about, you know, you must be taking our meat. And like I said, we don't want it. <laughs> A lot of us do our own. So, so just don't be surprised when you, you get basically a milk crate, you know, like a normal size milk crate. That's what we sort them in. Maybe one and a half milk crates. That's 
average deer, that's what you're going to get. So that's it on processing for, for now. Uh, so now if you do want to tackle it, home processing, I don't have enough time to go through all the cuts. So what I'm going to do is tips uh, and some tools. So here, this is actually a bow I shot last year, muzzleloader season. Uh, each did in my refrigerator downstairs. Um, it's a hind quarter. So we talked about quarters earlier. This includes the pelvis. So the, so the right hand side is actually bone in pelvis. It goes all the way down um, to the, you know, the hock. And actually the, you can see, you actually see the tendon I was talking about earlier, that, that hamstring. If that was cut at the place I work, we wouldn't, we wouldn't accept the deer. So um, the next start, we started talking about uh, tools that you're going to be using. So um, other thing too is, you know, you can get all these tools on a pretty decent budget. Um, but I'll start with, this is uh, the first, start with this saw. It's a boning, it's a bone saw, this 18 inch bone saw, hand saw, not required, but makes your life much, much easier. Um, I use it for removing the head. So I'll cut neck with the knife to the bone and then use that to uh, move that. I also will use it to split the pelvis at the end. I, I keep the bone in the rear quarter and that, that and I split it with a saw at the end. Um, next in line is a five inch curved semi-flexible boning knife. I've had that knife since, uh, 19, no, 2000. I got that knife in the year 2000. So that knife's 20 years old. Um, and it's a little bit shorter than it was, but for $20, it's lasted 20 years. It's, it's a great knife. They're cheap. Um, and they're designed for the job. There's not a slaughterhouse butcher shop in the country that doesn't use a Gornox. There's a few other brands. Um, these simple $20 easy knives, they sharpen well, they hold an edge, uh, they're easy to resharpen, they're, you can't go wrong. Don't go out and buy something fancy, you don't need to. Uh, next in line that I use is a steak knife. It's a, a nine inch scimitar um, steak knife and that's to cut the larger roast. Um, does a good job again. These Victorinox knives um, do a great job at sharpening, which is the last part, which I think is actually essential. You should actually get a hone or a, a steel. That steel at the bottom is to, is, to, is to hone the blade, not naturally sharpen the blade, but you will use that routinely throughout the processing of the deer. And then I've got a cutting board there, uh, but as we go down the list here, Cutting board is only for like final cuts in the house. Mostly uh, when I'm in the garage, I use uh, on the next slide, I think is the, uh, it's, uh, it's not the table, but next slide is the, the gambrels. Um, so the uh, gambrels I use, it's a, uh, I got them at Dick's and I think it was like 15 bucks. And I've had this for over a dozen years. It's pretty simple. Uh, does a great job. I have had no problem with the deer being, you know, too large. I've had it couple of pigs on these so they do a great job uh and the reason why i have to zoom in it's it's a pretty simple design and it, it you can really lift things you know with the mechanical advantage of four strings there but if you look close i've seen people assemble these wrong i've seen it it's, there's not the instructions may not be crystal clear when you set these up but that little teardrop shaped loop of metal as you see on the right hand side that's set up so that when you let go of, or you know as you start lowering the rope the rope will slide into the into the notch and actually cinch and that will hold the deer up so you can pull it down deer goes up and when you let go it holds the deer there um and then if you hold it off to the side you can slowly let that down um again simple it's you know less than 20 bucks i had this for a bunch of years it worked great um can't beat it um so that's the gambrels, that's the hanger deer. And then the last is the, uh, the table. But the best thing you can do is get a, it's a polyethylene folding table. Um, and it's, it's I cut everything on this. It's a cutting board. It's this polyethylene essentially is a cutting board. Uh, I process deer, I process my chickens, my turkeys, everything I raise here on that. Um, they clean well. Uh, they're easy to, you know, and they're great on their, their knives. And, you know, they don't, they don't pull your knives as, you, uh, as you're cutting right on them. Um, I typically will actually raise this up on the center blocks. Uh, it's a little bit better work height. Um, they, again, I've had this one for a bunch of years. It's, it's starting to rust on the bottom, so I'll, I'll probably replace it soon. But 
you know, for 50, 60 bucks, you got yourself a cutting board that's dedicated to processing. Um, okay, moving on, resources. Uh, YouTube, there's a, there's a ton of stuff on YouTube. Um, again, back to the original, you know, comment about ask four people, four hunters, their opinion, you'll get six answers. You can't go wrong with cutting up a deer. Um, so just find one that kind of shows what you want to see and, and follow it. Um, just, you know, reach out. I'm sure if you were to reach out to anybody, you know, DHA or, you know, the, the New York DHA, you reach out to me, I'll give you as many topics, you know, as many tips as I can. Uh, there's people out there, you know, I'm sure there's somebody out there. Uh, as far as cuts go, are pretty simple. When it comes to cuts, I like to do, um, I like to leave everything as large a piece as possible because it minimizes the surface exposed to the freezer bird. And so I'll leave the back straps maybe cut in half or maybe thirds. I don't, I don't cut steaks. I don't, I, so I don't package steaks in the freezer. If I would want to do a package, it's going to be equivalent to about four steaks worth and package it at one piece of meat. Um, I do a lot of roast, uh, and then steaks. So I, I usually I usually only cut steaks out of the back strap. Most come out of the hindquarters and the shoulders. Um, I and you can actually get away with um, without really. You don't need a grinder. I have a grinder because I you know my family eats a tremendous amount of pound of meat. Um, like you also canning if you can your meat. Everything that I would grind, I can also can. As a matter of fact, it's it's a lot easier and probably a little bit cheaper to especially if you have a canner already is a can that those pieces that would be left over. Um, so you know, there's the end of the possibilities are endless sausage snack sticks. Um, a lot of people will mix, uh, you know, various fats with them. And it's, you know, like I said, the possibilities are endless. Um, so then next up are, uh, some knife tips. I, um, try to, uh, you know, I really, I would like to actually kind of show a demonstration on how to, you know, different knife holds and stuff. I won't necessarily do it here on the camera, but um, um, one thing I hear a lot about is how bones will dull knives. And it is true that they'll dull knives, but if you, if you really have a couple of, couple of tricks, you can get away with not having your knife. First of all, I'm going to use, I don't know if you can see this. This is my, this is my sharpening steel. This is my, this is the boning knife that I always use. And if I'm going to sharpen this knife, if you look at it, it's at an angle as I, as I sharpen. If you cut the meat off the bone at that same angle, you're not going to dull your knife nearly as fast as if you go straight in or even at a, at a sharper angle. I see a lot of people going in at a sharper angle. That's going to dull your knife. If you went in there as if you were sharpening your knife along that bone when you're cutting off, it's, it's, that knife edge is going to last far longer. And if you go in there at it, any other angle than what's on your knife. Um, and it's, you know, it's, you're going along the knife, you know, even at joints, you're, you're going along the joint. You're not trying to cut through the joint. You know, the knife is not designed to cut into bones. You're cutting along bones. And um, I don't know, I, it, it, I've worked and used Tremendous number of knives, and you can cut on and long bones and not have it in the dull knife. So just um, keep that in mind that you know don't just pretend you're sharpening your knife when you're cutting along that bone. Try to cut into it. Um, and then finally, I got um, how to start. So it's pretty daunting, you know, if you have an entire deer. Ken's got a great story about uh, you know cutting up a deer. If you if you want to try it, you just you know you can't do the whole thing. Talk to the processor. Tell, tell the processor you want a ham. So you want a hind quarter or you want a front quarter. Just do just a quarter. Take it home, play around with it, and you've got nothing to lose. Um, and if you follow the seams of the muscles, they'll kind of fall apart on its own, you know, following those with a knife, you end up with, you know, you, you can't go wrong. The, the worst case scenario is it becomes, you know, stew meat instead of a steak. But, um, Oh, it's and like I said, YouTube will help you with that kind of stuff. You, there's certain cuts you don't really want to make a steak out of, you know, the parts of the shoulder, but there's a couple of parts of the shoulder that make an awesome steak. You know, if you cut out that uh, flat iron, it's a small steak just for you, kind of like the tenderloin. 
and it's it's awesome. It's a great steak. There's a bunch of them in there. Um, you know, it's just a lot of it. Get that. You know, I asked the processor, I know, can I have a chunk? They'll give it to you. you play around with it. Have fun. That's the whole thing about it. Just have fun. You, you, you can't you can't go wrong. Uh, there's really nothing to mess up. On that. So, all right. So uh, with that, I'm gonna now pass it over to Nate. Nate's gonna fill us in on some some other stuff kind of related to that. So Nate, I do think we're gonna throw up a poll. Um, Perfect. Because we have a couple of polls that we want to run um, for the guys that are on the call. Um, so the first one is is um, a little bit of a feeler on which region you're you're uh, hunting in. Um, so you should see it on the screen um, if you want to participate in the polling. <clears throat> Coming along, it's coming along. It's a lot in region one. Personally, I'm in nine, so I can't answer here because I'm running it. All right. Let's see. Yeah, so it's um, spread out between, um, there's some, some hunting out of state hiding below here. Um, so one, four, and out of state. So that's uh, pretty spread out. And um, we'll save the last one for, for later. Um, okay, Nate, over to you. Cool. A um, couple of things. First of all, Brian, I'm definitely going to steal the cinder block idea um, no. because every year we do ours, I'm 6'4", um, and we always are so sore from being bent over a table and Oh yeah. Well, that's, that's why I do it. So yeah. Sometimes you just got to put two and two together, I guess. Um, that's awesome. The second thing I wanted to say is I'm glad to see that a couple people said um, that they're planning to hunt out of state just because um, one of the first things I'm going to cover is uh, CWD, which definitely has um, implication for you. If you're hunting in New York state, something to be thinking about. Um, but especially if you're hunting out of state. So, couple of quick things uh, we'll get the disease discussion over with and we'll get back to the fun stuff um, but chronic wasting disease is um, it's a fatal disease in members of the deer family um, we haven't had a case in New York State since 2005 but um, the states that it is active in uh, are having a pretty serious problem with it it spreads fast um, it's an issue it's 100% fatal um, in deer there's no evidence that makes a jump to humans or anything like that. Um, but it's spread through deer to deer contact. So things like concentrated feeding, um, captive, captive cervid farms, things like that, um, deer farms. And so it's just something that I think everybody should be mindful of. Um, this is directly from the CWD regulations from New York state DEC. And I'll post the link to the whole document in the chat, but, um, basically it's just a few do's or don'ts. Again, no cases in New York, but it's one of those diseases you want. Once you have it, it's a big issue. So um, take precautions. One of the biggest things is, again, if you're hunting out of state, there's certain things you can bring back with you from an animal that you take out of state, and there's certain things that you can't. So um, you really need to do the homework, look into the regulations. Um, you know, some states you have to bring a clean skull and boneless meat only. Um, so if you go to you know, a certain state that has um, a big issue with chronic wasting disease, you might have to get your animal taxidermied in that state, for example. Um, it's all different depending on the state, what you can and cannot bring across state lines. But um, just look into the regulations again. I'll post them in the chat. But um, one of the biggest things, and it's the first thing that we see go in states that allow it, and then all of a sudden there's CWD um, is feeding. So deer feeding, a lot of people like to feed wildlife. Um, really highly recommended not to feed deer in New York state, just because, um, that direct deer to deer contact, it really increases that, which really increases the rate of, um, the spread of, of CWD. Um, and again, this is the, for all from the management plan, you know, check with your ECO. If you see deer acting strange, um, if you are planning an out of state hunt and you're not really sure what the regulations are, call your conservation officer. Um, they I was just speaking to our local um, Seneca County 
ECO the other day and he, he was telling everybody that he, he really loves to hear from people, especially new hunters. If you have a question, give them a call. Um, so definitely reach out if you have a question about CWD. And the other thing I'll touch on real quick is EHD, um, or I had to write it down, epizootic hemorrhagic disease. Um, it's super common in some Midwest states. It's another big killer um, in the deer population. Um, not usually an issue in New York, but this year, without a meeting today with some folks from the DEC, um, they had an outbreak in uh, the lower Hudson Valley, I think a couple of counties, Orange and Putnam, I think. Um, I believe the gentleman this morning said somewhere around 500 deer, they believe, were affected. Um, quite a few perished. So it's a thing, uh, unlike CWD, EHD, there's really not a lot of prevention, um, not a lot of control. So we do what we can. But again, the main point being stay informed. There's lots of resources. There's a lot of great podcasts and articles out there writing about chronic wasting disease. Um, there's always a section on it, on it in the Hunter Ed syllabus every year. So, um, you know, check it out, be informed, especially if you're going out of state. Now I will leave disease in the rear view um, and come back to first few bites, first meals. Um, Brian touched on a couple of the things that I wanted to talk about. You know, uh, this is part four of this series and we've really gone from finish Brian got you through, through butchering, um, and you've done all this terribly hard work and, um, it's got to pay off eventually. Right. And I think we know we're all motivated by food quite a bit. So, um, I really wanted to touch on just a couple of quick things that you could do as like really memorable, really, easy, um, first, first meals. Um, Brian touched on heart. We grew up leaving a lot of them in the woods. Um, and I often find myself kind of daydreaming about that now only I could go back. Um, we also grew up, we did have heart, um, like pickled, we'd have like pickled heart around the deer camp and whatnot. And it's really good. Pickled heart's awesome. But I think one of the best things you can do is just like cook it like a steak, do heart tacos, do, you know, steak and eggs with heart. Um, it's, it's just a really awesome cut of meat that is, it's talked about a lot right now. It's, it's a pretty hot topic. People are kind of reminding folks to eat eat heart. Um, but for the longest time, I mean, growing up, we never, we never did much with it. So I think it's one of the most special meals. It's definitely one of the most memorable meals after getting a deer. Um, you know, it's, it's just awesome. So I definitely recommend people do that. Um, and then again, Brian mentioned too, those tenderloins kind of like a, just for you thing. Um, it's not necessarily the one that you're going to give away to friends and family. Those, those tenderloins are, um, they're just a very small inside loin. Um, we grew up calling them, we actually grew up calling them backstrap, even though they're not the backstrap. Um, but they're just a small, very tender, very delicious um, piece of meat from inside the, the cavity of the animal. And mo a lot of times for folks, they don't even make it to the freezer. Um, they're so good. They're, they're, they're just fantastic. And I put treat yourself because I think it's like, having that tenderloin should be something that after you get this all done, it's kind of like heart. You, you really take it, take that moment to savor that and have that meal. Um, best cut of meat. I like it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very tough to, to argue with if once in a while we find one in the freezer, it's usually a pretty big surprise and um, we don't talk to many people about it, but um, things I put salt and fat. I think, you know, can't go wrong. Um, if you're, if you're new to cooking venison, you know, it's super lean, um, as, as you know, maybe, but, um, no matter what the fat is, you know, butter, olive oil, avocado oil, ghee, whatever, whatever your flavor, um, use a lot of it, use a lot of fat and use a lot of salt. Um, and, and really just enjoy it. Um, one of the other things that we've been doing a lot lately, if you are, you know, celebrating, um, a freezer full of meat that you just got yourself for the first time, and you do want to do a little bit of a crowd pleaser, we've been doing a lot of meatballs um around here and um they're phenomenal venison meatballs are, who doesn't like meatballs um it's a really good one if you're going to a party or um if you want to share with some co-workers or something like that um to show off a little bit i think you should you deserve it um and i also put share on here just because i think that that's one of the best things about wild food whether you foraged or um even if you grew something yourself or or um, went out and got some some fish or some venison or whatever it is, share 
I lost part of all this. And um, I, everybody, you know, some small portion of, of your experience and, and pass it on to somebody else, whether it's a colleague or a friend. Um, in college, I had, I've met a lot of awesome vegetarians um, and they would always be super excited if there was some, some wild, nice, healthy meat at a, um, at a barbecue that they could indulge in a little bit as a nice treat. Um, so yeah, so definitely enjoy that. Enjoy that food. Enjoy those first few meals. Um, it's nice to kind of commemorate your hunt that way. And then we'll move on. We'll keep, keep commemorating our hunt. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to folks about, you've come this far, you've had some food. Um, I just wanted to kind of go over a few options for taxidermy. Um, I've done them all. Um, the middle photo is not mine. I stole it off the internet. Um, but the other two are, um, I think, you know, it's, it's awesome to have a freezer full of meat. And eventually that freezer full of meat is going to be gone. And it's really, really nice and really, really special to have something, no matter what it is, big or small, to, to remember that, that experience or remember that animal um, through. So a couple options for deer. The first photo you'll see, it's just, it's just horns on a plaque. It's just a skull plate. It's basically a forehead. Um, that's my first buck. It's a really super inexpensive, um, fun, old school, classic thing that you'll see you know you might see the top of a garage door will have 20 or 30 of those um you know screwed up to the wall that have been accumulating over the years um like i said it doesn't have to be fancy i think my dad and i got that old it was like a kid's woolrich scarf at a at a antique store or thrift store or something and um you know you can kind of have some fun with it and do it yourself and the benefits to that are that it's you know it's it's personal preference and it's super inexpensive um the, the middle photo is a uh, skull mount or some folks will call it a European mount. Um, getting more and more popular these days. Um, they're fun to do by yourself as well. Um, there's tons of resources out there on how to do that. Uh, I think Ken's going to tell us a little bit about his experience with it. Um, but it's a great DIY uh, opportunity. It's also something that you can have done at a taxidermy or a taxidermist. And, um, it, you know, the pros it's, it's way more inexpensive than a full mount. Um, you know, it ranges from like, I know folks that do those for 45, 50 bucks. I know folks that, uh, high end taxidermists that'll do one of those skull mounts for a hundred bucks, 150 bucks. Um, but anywhere in that range, I mean, it's, it doesn't take up as much space. It's some people find it a little more tasteful. All of this is a big matter of opinion, but, um, but that's another way to go. And then the farthest picture over is um, a shoulder mount. And so that's kind of the, you know, maybe it's um, again, opinion, but maybe it's a little bit more of a special deer or a bigger deer or um, like that, for example, was my first Adirondack buck. Um, and it was kind of a no brainer for me that I was going to, you know, go the, go the full route and do a shoulder mount. Um, you know, the con, they're a little more expensive. Um, but it's a, it's a full, it's a full, um, representation of that animal. It looks just like it did when I saw him that day. Um, I think it's awesome to have it as a memory once the meat from that deer is fully gone and it almost is, um, you know, that quote unquote forever. Um, super exciting pros. It's great cons you know, you better be living with somebody that doesn't mind a half a deer hanging out of your wall. Um, which if you have one fine, but I, I hear this taxidermy stuff can get a little addicting. Um, regardless, I think it's, it's awesome. And again, one more time, it's an opinion, but I think it's great to do something. So whether it's a piece of hide, um, we have some hoofs mounted. Um, if it's a tail, um, we do squirrel tails and things like that. Something to, to kind of commemorate that first animal or 50th animal um, and just keep a little piece of it for yourself for when that meat's gone. Um, something to show off. Um, I think it's awesome. Quick little two cents, uh, read reviews um, because I find that taxidermy doesn't seem in my experience to be one of those things that it's like a, you get what you pay for thing. It seems much more regional as far as prices go. So it's not always that the most expensive um, taxidermist is going to do the best job. So read reviews, check out 
check out their profiles and um, portfolios and stuff like that. But um, on that list that Brian provided everybody with um, processors, there's also quite a few taxidermists listed on there as well. Um, I think that's just about it. I just wanted to say too, um, I sat in on a um, QDMA field to fork meeting yesterday and I saw some familiar faces from our BHA group and I saw some familiar faces from the participants that we've had um, in these Learn to Hunt series. And I just wanted to say, I, I hope everybody has a great season and um, I encourage you all to get involved because you'll find that in these communities, you, you're gonna end up seeing people in different, in different, um, in different groups. I saw Brian's face on a field to fork photo from, from last year and um, it's just awesome. It's great to kind of jump through these different communities and, and see everybody getting involved. And um, I'm super excited, super excited for all of you who are going out on your first, first hunt or first few hunts. And um, it's awesome. I do want to leave room um, for Ken to jump in. One of the things that we talked about recently was um, the processing and doing, going through field dressing, dragging, processing, taxidermy. Um, it's always for me been something that I've done with people with a group of people or at least one other person, I've never done any of that alone, but it's not impossible um, to do by yourself. And Ken's going to kind of lead us through his experience with one of his first. Yeah, it was not one of my first, it was the first. And uh, um, it was, um, it was pretty intense. It was, uh, I was lucky because I, like I said earlier, when I introduced myself, I, I'm from Norway and I don't have a family in the U.S. and and uh, didn't have a lot of friends that hunted. Um, but I do had one. I did have one. And um, a few years ago, when I uh, um, found out out that I really wanted to get into hunting because of, of fitness and getting better food and all that stuff got really hooked into the mediator scene and, and uh, listened to all the podcasts, watched all, watched all the shows and started doing um, archery and got really sucked into archery. So my first hunting season, um, I was lucky enough that my buddy had land, had just bought land and he let me hunt his land, which is about 76 acres, a lot of land for us, um, um, to, to get my feet wet and to, to just roam free. And um, usually he was with me. Usually he was some part somewhere else on the land. Um, so I had him as in my in my corner. Um, but one particular weekend, early November, there's a little bit of dusting of snow on the ground. It's uh, nice and frosty, and uh, he's on the west coast in LA for the weekend. Uh, but I still want to go out there. And um, and uh, now you kind of know that feeling. You know the feeling when the day is the day. And I'm out there and. Um, it's about 9.15 in the morning on a Saturday and I sit up in my stand and this spike buck comes in. Again, it's my first, so I wasn't looking for size. I just wanted to get something. A spike buck uh, comes walking by and I uh, actually have to bring out the call to, uh, to try to trick him back because he was walking away from me. And lo and behold, he turns back and comes around and gets into perfect shot, 35 yards straight ahead from me because I'm, I'm shooting uphill. So my stand is like right level with him at 35 yards, uh, which I felt comfortable with because I've been shooting every single day for six, seven months at a range. Um, so, so it's perfect shot. He runs about 30 yards or so and I hear him crash down. And I go through the whole cycle of, of super excitement, but I got to wait 30 minutes. I watched all the shows, talked to all the people or listened to all the podcasts and had all the theory. Um, so I, I brace myself, I wait, and then start climbing down after like 15, 20 minutes. I go um, get the stuff that I might need for the, for the process of, of getting it out and field dressing it. And I go track it and, um, and uh, do all the blood trailing and everything and find it there. And, um, and it's one of those, those experiences where you're out there in the woods, it's just dead quiet, it's you and the deer, and you're like, it happened. Everything I've been thinking about for six months, every single hour, every single day, it's happened. And now I have to deal with it. And my buddy is on the West Coast. I have no one that I know that hunts around me. Um, but I, I felt confident because I've, I've studied so much. I listened so much. I knew what I needed to do. So I got the dare down. Like I dragged it down, downhill and, and closer to where I had a side-by-side -side waiting. And, um, and, um, 
a little side story is that I travel for work. Every work, every every week I travel for work. So Monday morning, 5 a.m., I fly out of town and I'm gone until Thursday. So it's Saturday. I got a dare on the ground. I need to get this thing out of the woods and prepared and ready to go and packed away so there's not a single trace of a deer for my wife to see when I'm away during the week. So, so I know that I need to get this thing handled. So, um, so I'm like, what's next? So I know that I need to get it field dressed. Obviously, that's obvious. That's logical. So I need to get it field dressed, and um, I am uphill. So I'm alone. I'm, I, I get drag it a little bit uphill, so it's curved up. So I get the guts falling, so, sort of rolling down, and I tie tie the legs up and back uh, with some straps I have. And I go to I go to town um, and uh, do my first field dressing by myself and get the guts out and all that stuff. And then there's a pause, like, okay, now what? Now what? Um, so now it starts to get serious, right? Because field dressing, okay, um, you, you've started up on that, you know it needs to happen, but then you're like, now what? So um, so it's me. And then I have my iPhone and I'm like, okay, YouTube. YouTube is brilliant. I just need some support. I know what I need to do. I've seen so many videos. I've seen so many things. I've read so many things. So it's me and YouTube and the deer out there in the woods. So I get it up in a tree and I skin it right then and there. Now, in, in retrospect, I know that I don't need to skin it, but I was like, okay, I, I got to get this thing so clean that I can get it home so I can bring it into the kitchen and butcher it. So I, I strap it up. I used a side-by-side -side to get it up in a tree and off the ground and I skin it. And then once I've skinned it, I'm like, okay, um, now all that stuff, the guts out, I clean out the blood, the skin's off, it's, it's getting cleaner. Now it's just meat. Um, but I decide to quarter it out. So I quarter everything out. I have my, my, my cooler with ice and I stuff everything in the cooler and I just get rid of it. And then I clean out everything. I don't want to leave the guts out there because it's my buddy's land. And it was fairly close to where people walk around. So, so I just clean everything up and then um, I transport it all home. And I called my wife and I said, I got one. Um, there's going to be some, some meat in the kitchen. Um, and uh, so an hour later, a couple of hours later, I'm, um, I'm uh, in my kitchen. I got all the meat laid out. And I spent from one o'clock in the afternoon to one o'clock in the morning breaking down the meat again with YouTube and Stephen Rinella and Meat Eater side by side on my phone and just studying all these little videos of how to break down your venison, how to separate your quarter, how to separate the meat and, and all that good stuff and pack it up and everything. So one in the morning, my deer's broken down, it's all packaged away and ready to go in the freezer. Obviously I had the, the gun to my head with the fact that I need to get this thing cleaned out and in the freezer before I leave for work. So I had that pressure on me, but, but it's possible. It's you and YouTube and I'd never done this before. But I, I felt safe in the sense that I had that, that resource of knowledge out there. Um, and then Sunday morning, I'm like, I got I to gotta commemorate this thing. So, so I had the head in my garage, actually in the back of my truck. And, um, and I go to YouTube again and see, how do you do European mounts? So I find a video on YouTube where the guy does the whole process. And I follow along with my, with my head and... Uh, and spend the next four going to a, like a, a supply store for hairdressers where you can get the bleach that they use to bleach hair. And funny story, I walk into this hairdressing supply store and it's in the middle of November and the girl behind the counter is, is um, so you're a hunter, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna bleach your skull? And I go, yeah, how did you know? Well, because there's so many of you guys coming in here this time of year, it's you guys and hairdressers that come into these stores and, and you buy you buy bleach by the gallon. Hairdressers don't. <laughs> so it was it was really funny. And um, but I spent Sunday bleaching my my doing the European mountain, bleaching my skull. Um, so at Sunday night, I got a, a, a freezer full of meat and I got my own little uh, European Mount Skull that's with me all the time to commemorate my first, uh, my first kill. And let me tell you, it is, uh, it's definitely uh, addictive and I'm excited to, to, uh, to get more of them. And um, yeah, that's my first, that was my first and it was an intense experience, but man, did I feel like a man on Sunday, uh, let me tell you. Um, so I'll uh, just show you a few, like one uh, collage of pictures here, but um, yeah, 
it's it's the whole story of I got the deer, perfect shot, good blood trails, found the arrow, it was passed straight past through. And this is from when uh, I had my my kitchen full of meat. And this is the end product, a little bit of it. And then that's the, my, my Sunday European mount. And obviously um, some backstrap that went straight on the pan for, for the family to, um, to enjoy. And um, it was, um, it was uh, some of the best, the best day I've had in my, my life for sure. Um, so that was my first um, and uh, something to remember for sure. I feel like so I need Matt, to do one. I feel like I need to do one by myself now. I feel like I need to like tur turn down it's, help. It's, it's something you need to to have done at least once. <laughs> way it's way worth it. It's worth it. You Absolutely. know, putting the hours in and yeah. it's work. You know, yeah, it's yeah. work. But you know, it's 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 rewarding work. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so Matt Matt, before we go uh, and before we open it for a Q and A, I know we have a. Uh, uh, a Q and A got coming here uh, with some questions. Um, yeah. So, I think uh, I think what you're getting at, Ken, is uh, the public land pack out. Um, right. Yeah. We're running here through September. Um, we're coming down to the wire here, but uh, BHA is doing um, a public land pack out, um, and specifically through uh, New York's BHA, um, we're trying to get as many bags as garbage as we can. Um, if you can uh, get out on some public land and uh, get a garbage bell full of garbage, garbage bag, um, take a picture of yourself, take a picture of the bag of garbage. I, I did it last weekend. Uh, I took my kid out. We went upstate. We did a little bear hunting. Um, we filled up a bag with garbage, and I took a picture and made a post to Instagram, which is pretty huge. Um We'd, uh, put up uh, public land pack out, um, hashtag public land pack out, hashtag public land owner, hashtag New York BHA. And um, that's going to count um, towards um, our, you know, our number. Um, I believe, I believe uh, First Light's going to be donating some money. They're going to match, yeah. yeah. Some, some money per pack, per pack, per, uh, per bag. Yeah, per bag, you know, so we'll get some money um, to do some cool stuff for you with. Um, and uh, and that's it. So let's clean up some public lands and, uh, and get that going. The um, next one is, yeah, become a member. Yeah, I, you know, you should join BHA. Number one, you get a cool T-shirt. We all like cool T-shirts. Um, and they got a really nice one. I was just telling the guys before we started that I'm trying to, re-up myself and I'm going to use the link myself because I want to, I want that t-shirt. Uh, it's 35 bucks. You know, it's worth it. You're, you're supporting something that's, you know, I'm joined in this because it's something bigger than me. It's, it's going to leave a spot for my kids and, and his kids and my daughter. It's, you know, it's, it's worth it. Everybody here is fighting the same fight. We're all like-minded. We all like to have a good time. We all love to hunt. You yeah. know, um, get with us if you're new. Man, this is such a welcoming group. I've learned so much from these guys. And, you know, um, it's just such a welcoming group. It's I wouldn't want to be anyplace else. So uh, if you could join, that'd be great. We'd love to have you. Yeah. And I think that we, we lost the presentation on Google Slides. Um, it's, it, there's some connectivity issues there. Uh, so I think the last slide was, if you guys are first time hunters and you need to find mentors and you don't have one, reach out to the BHA community. Um, there's a lot of us that, that uh, would, would love to be mentors and, and um, go to the BHA website, go to our Facebook group, um, look up who the regional regional coordinators are for your for your area and and uh, get in touch, and you'll find a community of, of uh, like minded people that that will be willing to help you and um, and get you as far away from the hunt hunting spot as possible. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> hey man, even even here on Long Island, like I know a lot of guys on Long Island are right. you know that not as nice. They don't want to help out. I know people upstate are like always willing to help. For me, yeah. Um, but give me a call. I got a decent little group of guys. You know, we're all cool. We're all um, 
open-minded and, and, and willing to help, you know? So I know I saw on the, um, the poll there that a lot of guys were from Long Island. So yeah. Come on, give me a, give me a shout and uh, we, let's go hunting. Yeah. Um, so we'll open it for some Q and a, um, I think, um, the first one goes to, to, uh, to, um, Brian. Um, it's a question about how quickly would you skim the dare to help it cool generally? Yeah, that's a big fat gent. Um, you, uh, you know, it depends on temperature depends on, you know, where you shot it, you know, typically on season, it's usually cool enough. You don't have to skin it right away. Um, but early season, you know, so bow season starts next week. If it's 80 degrees out there. You want that deer to cool down as quick as possible. Um, well, I say that, but within reason, like don't, don't put your deer in the freezer because it's, that's not a good idea either. Um, but so if it's hot out, do it as soon as you can. Um, usually what I do is before I actually skin it, I'll get a bunch of bags of ice and I'll put a couple of bags of ice in the chest cavity. Then I'll, because I hang it, oh, this is a question that somebody had earlier. I hang, I hang deer uh, uh, rear end up, hind legs up. Uh, so I have two bags in the cavity because they fall right in the cavity. And then I'll put two bags on the hind quarters. And that will really help the process of starting to cool things down. Um, if it's a typical bun season, November, 40, you know, 30, 40 degrees during the day, maybe a little cooler at night. The best easiest time skinning a deer in my opinion is a day and a half this is it for a day and a half and it's it starts to uh, dry a little bit it separates a little bit it'll feel feel real easy um uh the guy i work for like i think I alluded to earlier he was more into it for the deer hides at the time deer hides were worth a lot of money um and so we used very little knife work there was there was to be no holes in that hide um we would have a we would have a heart attack if we put holes in that hide so we did a lot of pulling. And if, it, if that deer was too fresh, you got too much fat on it. If it was too old, it was just, it just kind of glued, especially around the uh, legs, that, that hide would be real hard to get off. About a day and a half, it'd feel really nice. Um, so yeah, it all depends on temperature. You do want it to cool down. You know, it's, it's not, it's, it's hard because it's, it's definitely a learning curve, but you know, you, you don't need to have that thing 30 degrees 20 minutes after you shoot it, you know, it, it's going to start cooling down right away. You want to get it, you want to hang it up, but if, you know, it's not, you know, the first place it's going to start to spoil is around the back legs. Uh, that's why when, when uh, gutting a deer, it's crucial to get all that out of the pelvis. That's, that's, that's what's going to happen. You would see many times at the processor, people would never remove the anus. So all that stuff was still in the cavity. That will rot that deer within hours. Within, a, within 12 hours, it'll start to it'll start to rot right around there. Um, so that I would say the hind quarters are the number one thing to cool off. But, but the hide, but it, uh, the inverse, <clears throat> uh, muzzleloader season up here can be wicked cold, and you want to have uh, you might want to leave that hide on for a while to keep it from freezing, keep the deer from freezing. Um, so it's you know it's you got to play the weather if it's warm get it off quick it's cooler you leave it a couple of days you know if it's really cold you might want to leave it on a little bit because it's still insulative it, it'll save from freezing there's nothing harder than trying to cut up a frozen deer you really it's really tough and the processor's not going to like a frozen deer either so that's it's a long way to answer on that because it's the problem is it's it just depends there's so many depends on there but try to try to follow that and um you should be all right with that good stuff there was a, a question that just came up. I don't mean to cut you off, Ken, there, but uh, I guess Rob had asked the question. Um, on Long Island, um, you can – it's two hours before sunlight you're allowed to park on Long Island. You're not allowed to park overnight. Um, two hours – if you get there before two hours before sunlight, sit in your car – I recommend, especially in the first couple of days of the season, if you got a spot in mind, you need to get there early and um, you just sit in your car. Because if you do go out of your car and DC does drive by and it's not, you know, it's before two hours, 
they'll they'll come and find you and write you a ticket. But if you're sitting in your car at the spot, they're not going to say a word to you. They're just going to drive right on by. Um, I know Gary. He he's on on Long Island here. He he said last year that he got to a spot at 3 a.m. and um, like four or five cars had passed by him. Um, I, I've had the same situation multiple times, but it's two hours for sure. Um, but sit in your car and be there if you want to hunt it. Yeah. Cool. All right. Any other comments, guys? It looks like there's Throw a in Real quick about uh, uh, fat. They had mentioned fat, salt and fat. Um, there's, a, there's also a pretty good myth around deer fat. Uh, I mentioned earlier I was going to talk about it. I forgot about it. Mm. Uh, I, use, I save all the deer fat. Um, don't use it for cooking per se. I do season my cast iron skillets with it. It does a great job. Um, I make soap out of it, but it really, they, they, they talk about it tasting bad. And if the fat has gone rancid, it will taste bad. Deer fat in general tastes like the meat. The problem with deer fat is it solidifies at a higher temperature than human body temperature. So when you have that liquid fat on your your, your ribs, and you, once you put it in your mouth, it will solidify. Mm. It tastes like you're eating a candle. Hmm. It's, it's not necessarily the taste; it's the texture. It's a texture issue. Um, I can I can a significant portion of my uh, deer, which is a great way to do it. You know, great way to preserve it because it, it doesn't have to be refrigerated. And like you know, we had tacos; you just throw it in there, and the tacos are done. There's always a chunk of fat at the top because you can't get every ounce of fat off when you're cutting it up. It never tastes bad. I mean, I flick it off. I, I mean, I'm not ready to, you know, eat, you know, eat it as part of it. But if that tasted bad, it would make a whole jar taste bad. It doesn't. So it's, you know, don't be afraid of the fat. It, it's going to, once you put it in your mouth, you're going to say, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. But it's, uh, it's, don't, people get so fastidious about, I've got to get every slice of silver skin and every chunk of fat off of that meat. You really don't have to. Um, it's, that's not where the, it's not where the, I'm going to say, gamey taste come from. Um, it's it, gamey taste comes from mishandling. That's that's you know it's cutting it improperly, not getting the guts out in time. That's that's what's going to make it taste off. Brian, can you talk a little bit more about using and saving deer fat for cast iron? Uh, well, the, the number one thing is um, you have to render it. So I save it up. I've got a grinder and when I save all the bits and pieces, I'll run it through the grinder. So it, um, it's small because you happens is it, it way it's kind of packaged in the animal. There's, it has like almost like little pockets. And if you don't grind it, it takes a significantly longer time to render it out. So I, I put it in the pan, I'll put that tiny bit of water in there to warm it up. It'll start to melt immediately. Use a thermometer. And actually that's another good point for deer meat. I'll get back to that in a second. Um, 240 is the top. Don't let it get above 240. At that point, all the water that's in that fat is now uh, boiled, evaporated off. So it's just a basically a pure fat. Let it cool a little bit. I'll put it right in the Ziploc bags, seal it up, and it's it's shelf stable. I've got lar I've got venison tallow downstairs that's two years old. You open it up and it it has no smell. I mean, it's, it smells like it smells like Crisco. You know, it's um, the, the trick is is rendering it. So getting all that water out. The water is what's going to make it go bad. Um, now that's, and, that's the actual fat or that's like you save like the silver skin on the, on the side of the meat. Uh, it's fat. It's mostly fat. There'll be a little bit of silver skin in there because you know, a lot of times when I'm trimming something, there'll be, you know, silver skin be part of it. Um, I usually actually like thinking back straps. I leave the silver skin on a back trap while it's frozen. It's another layer of protection. If you think about it, you know, every time you sit down to a strip steak, it's, they don't cut the silver skin off that, off, off a cow. You know, it's, it's on there. So you, 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 know, you don't have to eat it. I, I do strip it off. I do the fish uh, skin technique. You know, so you've got your, you've got your back strap, cut a steak off the end, you grab onto that steak, and then you, you know, twist your knife and zip it down there, and it, uh, the silver skin comes right off, and then you just trim it off that last steak. And With that steak, it gives you a good handhold. I've seen it where the you know, they'll have silver skin up and they strip it along there and like little thin strips. 
Yeah, if you flip that over, you've got a good sharp knife, and you got that angle just right, it'll it'll peel that off, and you lose no meat or anything. With that steak, you can pull it right out. So, nice. And then the other one too is um, use a thermometer cooking steaks. It's really easy to overcook venison. It's a lean meat. You want that medium rare. You know, if if you don't want pink, you'll go a little bit higher, but you know, venison is better when it's it's got some pink in it because it's you're gonna overcook it. It's gonna be tough and it's not gonna taste good. It's uh, it's, it's mostly because it's so lean. Thanks, you I guys. Got a, I got a question for you, Brian. When you were saying with that zip tie, yep. you're you're going around the anus. You're pulling yes. it out, zip yep. tying, and then going back in. I well, yeah, yeah. So. So the very first thing I do with the deer is I'll make sure it's dead. Yeah. Um, but if you, if you, you know, kind of poke around in there, it's the normal, the, the cavity inside a pelvis is about that big around. Mm -hmm. So you start around the anus and you kind of you know, get the skin out. And then a lot of times I'll use my finger to get in there to just to guide it and make sure I'm in the pelvis, in that pelvis cavity and not in the hind quarter. You have a, if you have a thin blade, you get that, and you can actually feel the bone. You just ring around the bone that frees the whole thing up, or at least at least the length of your knife frees up. I pull it out, and I zip tie that so no feces comes out. And then when I go from the inside, again you can use your finger or use the knife to free it up from the pelvis. You pull that whole thing in and straight out, nothing nothing leaks. Um, if it's a doe, there's no urine. You know, a buck eater, you don't have to worry about urine that way either because it's going to kind of come with everything, and then you can cut it, you know, clean it later. But, um, if you pull it out that way, it's it's so much cleaner. Um, and then it, I, like usually, that, it's, I usually, you know, uh, the way Ken was talking about neck up and um, they talked about last week, you know, you're uphill and all that, and that's great, and it pulls that, but when it finally comes to the last pull is it, it's out of the, right. out of the pelvis and across and they usually come out squeaky clean really good cool. that's good yeah. definitely trying that out all right um i think just real quick i just want to say too like something I, I don't think we really said earlier is like the field dressing stuff can be kind of daunting and the only thing that you can do is like do it right mm -hmm. um and i've you know i'm not that old i've you know shot it dozen or so deer and I, and I feel dressed a bunch of them and I'm, I'm never I'm never like oh I remember every single step of this <laughs> so learning it is like one of those things like you know I'm 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 trying to always tell myself and I don't do it as much as I should but trying to tell myself like to feel dress other people's deer if I'm in on them and like um just get experience with it but for people who are like brand new and might be doing it by themselves I did see the other day and I don't know how good it is but I did see the other day, like, I think it's dead down wind makes a little field dress kit and it's got like your gloves. And I think even a couple different length gloves and, um, like a wipe and it's got like just a few different things on this nice little kit. One of which is a small instruction on like basic field dressing. And I don't know how great it is. Um, but I just thought that was a cool resource and I wanted to make sure that I shared that I'm pretty sure they were dead downwind. Hmm. Yeah, just take your time. Don't, I mean, you want to get them out as soon as possible, but don't rush. You, you know, as long as you don't puncture anything, you're going to be okay. I mean, you're going to get it out. Just, you know, take your time. It is daunting because it's, you know, they can't see half the stuff. And then you got to be a little bit cautious, especially bow hunting because there might be a broadhead in there. You know, working in the shop, we routinely, we had a bucket of broadheads that we would find in there. Um, so, you know, there's an aspect of being careful, but, you know, just, slow and steady and you know the headlamp works because then you don't have to have to try to hold a flashlight at the same time um it's you know just one step at a time one step at a time yeah. stop and think and then move yeah i think i think uh, cool. I, you know i just want to touch on this uh, i know you said brian you don't you don't really quarter a lot of deer out i i um I wind up hunting in a pair of blue jeans and a t-shirt a lot of times. I hunt in some funny spots um, where I don't really want people to know what I'm doing in there. Um, <laughs> and the Prius. <laughs> pretty, pretty populated area. And there's some you know, little spots. But anyway, 
I, I wind up quartering deer out, cutting hooves off in the woods, and, and it comes out in a backpack. And um, same like you said, I mean, the front shoulder comes comes right off. It's not connected with a bone. Mm -hmm. um, the rear quarter comes out relatively easy with a little pushing and a little pulling. Um, you cut that back strap out. There's a little bit of waste. You know, sometimes I'll leave the ribs in the woods. Um, depends on where I am and how much time I have. Right. Um, you know, but that's another option. Just don't, don't think that, you know, you can't hunt on a piece of property because it's, it's too tiny or somebody's, you know, if it's public land, you, you can hunt it and you can get it out discreetly if you have to, hmm. you know? Okay. That's it, man. All right. Well, um, I don't think there's anything else. And this was the last installment for this time. But I think we'll be doing it um, monthly and we'll do a sort of a deep down special session on something um, each month. Um, so that's on the plan. So look out for those. Um, but um, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, absolutely. Good luck. Uh, Have fun. Be safe. Reach safe out. Hunting. Safe hunting. Great. Any questions? Awesome. Yeah.